A warm welcome to this second refresher tutorial for the Operational Combat series of war games. Today we're going to look at artillery and air, um, which has a huge influence on the game. We're going to look at the various missions the two can perform and where one has the advantage and where the other has the advantage. We're going to look at who can fire when because it's quite intricate within the sequence of play. We're going to look at barraging combat units and barraging facilities. And then we're going to digress a little bit into all the stuff around air that allows air to come and have an influence on the battlefield. So some of the basics, the sequence of flying and the sequence of combat, the uh, interdiction, either in interdicting the other side's air power or interdicting the other side's movement, air defense, and finally, ground attack specifics. I'm then going to look at a case study to um, stop this from being all theoretical and examine the situation at the start of the Tunisia campaign just to get you into a sense of how do I integrate this into a bit of planning. So let's get into it. The missions. So artillery. I mean, you know, it's all fairly straightforward. It degrades the enemy's defenses when you want to attack. It softens them up. It disorganizes them at least and it takes a step loss or two. It also disrupts the enemy's attack forces if you've had them in reserve during the reaction phase. And it can interdict nearby facilities. So if you're up against a city that support or has an air base and stuff, you may be able to use artillery to attack those facilities and degrade them. Air has a much longer list. Number one, in my mind, is that it can suppress enemy air power. Once you've suppressed enemy air power, then you can bring the rest of your air power to play. It also can degrade the enemy, both facilities and combat units. Um, it can interdict the enemy's deep rear using train busting and barrages onto facilities. It can defend your own airspace. It can supply uh, advanced or encircled units. I'm going to ignore the rest of supply and do that in a later uh, video. And on operational level, it can help introduce a bit of surprise by dropping airborne units or be doing big redeployments or extending your supply off into, uh, into the distance. So lots and lots. If you haven't read Dick Eichenlaub's article in Operation Matters, which is also available on the OCS depot, then do so. It's, it's not very long and it's incredibly helpful. One of the things I think people struggle with is because there's a kind of a big Venn diagram overlap between air and artillery is when to use which when and what are they good for. So the pluses and minuses of the two is first of all air. It's got long range. I mean, self-evidently. Usually, you know, the vast majority of the map. Secondly, the supply cost is minuscule. One T per airbase, irrespective of the level of that airbase. So you could, uh, on a level one airbase, you get two air units refitted. On a level four airbase, you get eight refitted. Uh, one for an airstrip. If you put that in artillery terms, one T for artillery gives you a two strength barrage, which is, tr which is nothing. It also allows you to contain the enemy's reserves. So you see their reserve markers. You can identify those reserves and go, right, I'm either going to try and pop those reserves by disorganizing them, or I'm going to put some train busting down to limit their operational movement. Likewise, you can contain the enemy's exploitation. So in your reserve movement, you can go, oh, he's going to be attacking here. So again, I'll put some barrages down to limit that attack if I can, and some train busting to limit the extent of any exploitation after a, a successful attack. Train busting is a uh, unique air mission, and certainly by me, is underutilized. And hip shoots for those air forces that are allowed to do it is a massive bonus that allows you to set up overruns and make merry across large chunks of the battlefield. Artillery, in comparison, is steady eddy reliable. So air, when it attacks, has to go through flak, and you may well get an abort. No aborts with artillery. It always succeeds. Um, it's also 
always available. So even if you've lost air superiority, or you've you know had your tactical air forces damaged a lot, you still always got that artillery to fall back on. It is uh, more destructive. So on these square bracket half results, where half the time it's just a disorganization and half the time it's a disorganization and a step loss, with artillery, you get that. With air, you don't. These square bracket halves are just disorganization for air. Um, artillery is just more abundant. So, you know, your air units are super precious and you just don't have that many of them, certainly not in comparison to the amount of artillery that you have lumbering around the place. More importantly, using artillery on the frontline targets releases your air from having to do frontline targets and allows them to exploit this range, which is, you know, a major characteristic of your air power. And it doesn't need anything else to be effective. So for air to be effective in the barrage and train busting roles, it needs fighter sweeps and air defenses and air bases and all of that kind of stuff. None of that for artillery. It just needs an artillery unit and some good old supply to make it effective. Who can fire when? So, boom, Ooh, everyone likes a nice complicated table. So we've got which phase you can do stuff in and which segment in that phase you can do stuff in and what can artillery and hip shoot aircraft and aircraft doing barrages and train busting and just for the sake of completeness naval i don't really cover naval in this one if you've got a naval game you probably just need to read the naval rules just to catch up so in the movement it's only hip shot that can be effective in the movement's air and naval barrage, it's air doing barrages and train busting uh, that is the main thing. In the reaction phase, the movement again has hip shots. So you can see that hip shoots don't just appear all over the place. They always appear before you get to do anything else because they're combined with combat unit movement. In the reaction, yes, artillery can barrage so long as they are in reserved and they're released from that reserve. Uh, and regular air can do barrages and train busting. In combat, it's only artillery that can impact the, the major set piece combat. And then in movement, again, hip shoots do in movement. And in exploitation, the artillery, again, it would have needed to be in reserve and that reserve to be released. And more air barrage and more train busting. So you can see that artillery is a bit plodding. It really only gets to fire in combat or in reaction and exploitation if you have them in reserve. Have artillery in reserve. It's a good thing. It's just a free hint there. Whereas the air is much more effective, whether it's doing air barrages or train busting or hip shot. The, the sequence of that will come second nature to you, but it's important to it's important to not blow everything all at once. If you've used all of your artillery in the combat uh, phase, then you're probably not using it right. And if you're only using air barrages and train busting and hip shots for uh, the, uh, the combat phase, you're probably not doing it right either. Make sure you have stuff available for the reaction phases and the exploitation phases. They're really important too. Barraging in troops. Now, luckily, there's this excellent table, which is, you know, once you skim through it, it's both pretty easy to remember and fairly self evident. The sequence is you pay for artillery supply. Obviously, air is done differently. If you use more than one artillery unit to combine, they have to come from the same HQ or the same dump. You can't use internals, you can't use out of supply. Most people use the house rule that you can fire less than the full barrage strength of your unit. So I don't know, say you've got a, a 100 strength point barrage unit, but you don't happen to have two supply points, eight tokens, and well, you could just use two tokens and fire on the, the eight level, for example. Why that isn't core cool rules, I'm not sure, but anyhow. Apply any shifts. So usually either for density of the target, how many units are in the target, for the terrain, flash uh, hedgehogs, 
for whether you have a spotter, i.e. whether you have a combat unit next to the target, whether they're in strat mode, or whether if they are aeroplanes, they're less than 10 hexes from their base, uh, roll two dice and a third dice. The two dice will give you the result on the combat table, and the third single dice will determine these half results. And then just apply the disorganizations and the step losses. Pretty straightforward. As usual, from what I learned playing ASL actually, or uh, squad leader, is the rule of sevens. So look at what your average roll on two dice is going to give you adjusted by the shifts and that will determine whether it's a, a reasonable punt or not or whether you're starting to push your luck so obviously a seven on a eight to eleven barrage is you know probably going to disorganize if you go down to a five then you're needing some shifts to get to that magical seven barrage on facilities sort of ditto it's kind of like three tables in one which can be a bit hard to read so there's three types of results there's the results in brackets there's the asterisk result and there's the straight number results like the ones here the sequence is basically the same as firing on combat units one target per type per hex i didn't mention this on the uh, on the previous one you only get barraged once the target a phase. So if you have a, a hex with some troops and a port and an air base, only one of those can be attacked in a phase. Um, you can attack the air base with or without airplanes. You can attack the port. You can do some train busting. Um, port capacity is slowly degraded by the number of hits that you've managed to hit on the port. Uh, airbase capacity is the single number, so these ones or ones and twos are uh, bringing down the airbase a level. And the hits on aeroplanes is per aeroplane on the base that you attack, you need to roll the number in brackets or higher. And then finally, for train busting, you need to roll the um, asterisk. And that's just a bit of that basics around air so that's kind of it and you could I could have sort of stopped on the air and the artillery as barrage units with a bit of train busting um, on the side but actually to make air work and useful you need to have kind of the rest or most of the rest of the air rules there so five types of air units Fighters, tactical, transport, strategic, and combined. I'm not going to major on strategic and the combined fighters. Go around fighting things, usually with a teeny bit of uh, barrage strength as well. Tactical, tactical bombers really, only have air defense and they have a uh, barrage strength. And then transport have an air defense, in this case, very poor. Uh, do have a bombing strength, in this case, very poor but crucially they have a transport rating this half t they can bring half a token in you need air bases you can stack on an air base four active units plus the air base level so if you've got a level three air base that would be seven active airplanes on an airstrip that's only four active there's no limit to the number of inactive air units you can have on a base but be wary, that makes them an interesting target for uh, any barrage against facilities. You refit the number of aircraft times the base level. So if you've got a level one airbase, you refit two. If you've got a level three airbase, you refit six. Uh, an airstrip just refits one. These refits occur in the refit phase, which is before the reinforcement phase, I think. So right at the beginning of the term, and that's it. That's your bu air budget for the rest of the turn. You can return from a mission uh, to any airbase. So um, unless you're aborted above an airbase, then you have to return to that airbase. So it kind of allows you to both go and do a mission and then do an airbase transfer. Uh, and airbases give you flak per their base level with the exception of airstrips. Aircraft, two steps. You fly one type of mission together that could be in a stack of up to four 
Um, you use that mainly for transport and barrage and airdrop missions and stuff. Um, you can fly, as you've seen earlier, in the movement, the reaction, and the exploitation phases. They become active once you've refit them at the beginning of the turn, and they become inactive after you've done a mission or you've aborted. With the exception of fighters that have successfully intercepted above a friendly airbase, and transports that have transported within their normal range. Finally, you can do uh, base transfers. So if you don't want to do the conductor mission and then move to a different base thing, particularly if you want to take advantage of the double range for base transfers, then you can do that and suddenly have your Air Force pop up in a completely different end of the map. There are two sequences that are central to the air rules. There are some others, but the two central ones are the mission sequence, um, which is pretty common. So you declare what type of mission you have from the uh, choice of seven. Uh, you move the planes to the mission hex, the target hex. You resolve any air combat from any active air units at that hex. You then resolve any interception. If there's a fighter within a patrol zone, and hexes, they can come along and intercept you. They don't have to, you know, if it's a, a bit of a rubbish air unit, they don't have to come and attack one of your big air units. Resolve the flak uh, at that target hex, then actually do the mission. So barraging troops, barraging facilities, doing train busting, and then you return to your base and, you know, usually become inactive. The air combat procedure is in a target hex where there are planes from both sides, you lay out those aeroplanes and then you can do a voluntary abort because there may have been some fog of war around this. You may not have realized, oh, look, there's a spitfire in there. I didn't realize. So if you do voluntary aborts, you can send back defenders onto the air base so they don't have to fight uh, or you can send back your attackers so long as you leave one remaining to have at least one fight, you then pair up the attacker fighter with any defending aircraft, usually fighter against fighter. You roll the classic three dice, so two subtracted by the air combat rating. So, so you've got your Spitfire with a, a rating of five and you've got a, a Mackie MC-202 with a rating of three or something. So it's a plus two to the Spitfire. You roll on this table. Um, and you roll what the third dice to see if any of these abort results become a step loss. So one, two, three, four, no step loss, five, six, a step loss. And then once you've done a round of combat, you can voluntary abort again. So imagine here you'd gone, oh my God, they're massive. And you'd aborted everything except for one fighter. Then that fighter goes through a round of combat and then that can go and uh, do a voluntary abort as well. And then you repeat for each of the pairs that you have paired up until there's no one left on one side or uh, you haven't got any fighters left. They're pretty straightforward, those sequences. I mean, they're quite multi-step, but actually they become second nature pretty quickly. Um, what I've called air to interdiction, I know train busting used to be called interdiction before it was given a worse name, but anyhow. Fighter sweeps is interdicting your opponent's air force. You use your fighters to go out and suppress the enemy's active air units. I think this is the most important mission for any air force to try and gain air superiority, uh, either in a local area or across the map, ideally. You move a single fighter in the movement segment of movement or reaction or exploitation to a hex with an active enemy unit. You do air combat sequence. There's, there's no flak in this. You abort the attacking fighter to any air base in range and you repeat until you get the result you want. So if there's a, an active enemy air unit, fight, send a fighter against it, have air combat. If you make that air unit that you wanted to become inactive, inactive, then boom, job done. And then you can start sweeping up against another one. Or if it refused to go down, if you lost the air camp up, send another one and you can keep on doing that. Train busting is interdicting the enemy's rear area movement. 
And that can be both the distant rear area and kind of local to the front line. It's an underutilized mission, or I underutilize it. It can limit the ability to react in the reaction phase of your enemy's reserves. It can limit the ability to exploit in the exploitation phase of your enemy's successful attacks. It can uh, degrade the rail capacity of your enemy, and they won't thank you for that. And it can slow down the arrival of reinforcements and replacements, which is always a good thing. It's a particularly great mission for fighters that aren't needed for fighter sweeps and who have a low barrage strength. You know, what's the point of a fighter with a barrage strength of zero? Train busting, going around shooting up the place. That is a great mission for them. You simply move to your target, resolve any flak, int, try and avoid places that have flak, road junctions and stuff that are unprotected by HQs and all the rest of it. Resolve on the barrage versus facilities table. Usually you'll have a one in three or a half chance of uh, your train busting succeeding. Uh, you need this asterisk result. If you succeed, you put down a train busting marker, which creates a zone of one hex all around that marker. Leg units pay uh, one movement point to go through the target hex. Uh, truck and tracked movement take one movement point per train busting zone. So you might get three extra movement points on them and anything going uh, on a railway through the train busting zone will have to use double the rail capacity. Great use of low barrage strength fighters. Air defense tries to put off all of these uh, barrage attacks on you and train busting on you. You can either use interception, uh, and this is your weaker air forces, your weaker fighter forces friend, because interception is voluntary. So you can do this mission if there's a target hex that has flak in it and it's within 10 hexes of your patrol zone. You don't have to do it uh, and you can only do it once per mission on that target hex. You resolve the air combat as normal if you decide to do it. Uh, if you lose, then you just go inactive on your home base. But if you win, you can stay active on your home base and continue to do interceptions, which is pretty neat. Flak, stack for flak is my new uh, watchword, ideally within patrol zones because patrol zones improve flak. You flak against barrage and train busting and hip shots. If you flak against barrage missions and train busting missions and hip shots, and if they are in patrol zones, you also flak against transport, airdrop, and base transfer missions. Um, the old two dice with a modified 11 will give you a flak result, which doesn't sound too promising. It's only a 3 in 36 chance of causing a step loss through flak, but it's all about the mods. So if it's a big mission that you're flying, three or more units, you get a plus. If there's an HQ there, you get a plus. If there's an airbase, you get a plus per airbase level. So that's up to four. If there's a flak value printed on the map, as there often can be, you get uh, a plus. If you are in an enemy patrol zone and there are no fighters in your mission, you get plus two. If there's at least an escort, you only get plus one. And if you are train busting, you also get plus one. So that's all the rules refreshed, I hope. What does this really look like? So let's have a look at the very start of the Tunisia campaign. Love Tunisia, such a sweet, sweet game. This is Tunisia 2, technically. Here we have the uh, upper uh, right-hand corner, and here are the air bases for the Allies. The light ones are air strips, the dark ones are full air bases. So Allied air bases have a capacity to have 12 
active aircraft on them. There is, in addition, a box over to represent stuff in Algeria, which has unlimited stacking. The at-start Air Force for the Allies has nine fighters, three tactical bombers, two transports. So that's 14 aeroplanes. Plus, over in Algiers, they have three more aircraft that have this surge capability, which is a game-specific rule for Tunisia. In comparison, the Axis have 16 air bases. So these one level, a couple of two level air bases with their increased flak, uh, a couple more airstrips and a, an air base off the map in uh, Sufax. They have a box similar to Algiers over in Sicily. They have seven fighters, so slightly less, three tactical bombers, the same, and four transport. So they also have 14 aircraft. However, six of their aircraft are hip shoot capable. All of the German aircraft with barrage ratings. Plus, they have six aircraft that can use this game specific surge rule, four of which are hip shot. And basically, the Luftwaffe can do hip shots. Uh, for their planes that have uh, barrage ratings, the Italians can't. That's roughly what the two sides look like, roughly equal. They are limited by their patrol zones. This is a, a, a rough indicator of the limit of the German patrol zone and this of the Allied patrol zone. So there is this uh, zone in between where uh, there are no interceptions, and where there are uh, where flak is weaker and that's something that probably both sides but particularly the allies want to uh, address what do you do with this rough assessment first of all i like to get into the weeds a bit and do a, a more detailed force comparison so fighter strength so here are the different combat ratings of your fighters so the axis have three fivers top aircraft the Allies also have three. The Axis have one four. The Allies have four fours. So the Allies have a significant advantage in top-rated fighters. You can see the rest. The strength here is the combined combat rating of all of these aircraft. So all these together, the Axis have 24 combat strength on the map in Tunisia. And then in their surge box in Sicily, they have another 12 for 36. The Allies, you can see on the map, have a significant advantage. Uh, they only have three, so they have a similar total, but much more is available on the map than it is for the Axis. If we have a look at the uh, tactical bombing, we see that the Axis has much better. So these are, I've put these on the barrage table. So these are columns on the barrage table rather than their actual strength uh, on this central bit. So you can get a 12 barrage from one plane and an eight barrage from one plane plus two more in hip shoots. So uh, in comparison, the allies don't have any of these big bombers to start with, but they can only start attacking uh, on the five column unless they do combinations and stuff like that. Actual strength is pretty similar. So the Axis on the map have a barrage strength of 28, and that is the actual barrage strength all added up, compared to the Allies at 27. It's the Axis's surge capability that increases that by as much and more again. And also, not to be sniffed at, is the hip shoot capability of the Axis and the Axis surge is huge. I think the Italians only contribute about three barrage strength points uh, at the start of the Tunisia campaign. In comparison, the Allied tactical bomber strength is a lot weaker. So the Allies have the fighter advantage, the Axis have the tactical bomber and hip shoot barrage advantage, particularly through the use of surges. Uh, and both need to ex extend, I've said exceed, extend their patrol zones. That's kind of the weight of forces between the two. What then do you do? Finally, in this little case study, there's what I think you should do. Terms and conditions apply. This may not be the best plan, but anyhow, this is what I thought your strategy should look like. So for the allies, 
I would prioritize building airstrips or air bases further forward to extend that patrol zone umbrella under your advancing forces. Your number one job to do. I know it's an engineering job, but it's still out there. Your air force is going to suffer for having air bases too far in the rear. Number two, air sweep with your quality fighters. You have a seven to four advance in what I'm calling quality fighters. Those are fighters with air combat strengths of five or four. Go after the Axis Air Force, bring down their patrol zone network, and then once that's down, go after their uh, bombers that are active on air bases and see if you can suppress the whole lot, because if you don't, the Axis tactical bomber and hip shot advantage is going to tell on your forces. Number three, having brought down the fighters with their air sweeps, go and barrage those vulnerable air bases. See if you can reduce the capacity of those level two bases down to level one. That would be fun. Use artillery against frontline units. So don't waste, waste your uh, air force on the front line. Use it in the depth of the axis rear. The axis haven't got much of a rear, so that will be painful. Use an air reserve. So don't blow everything on the movement uh, phase. Have something for the reaction phase to blunt any axis attacks that you can see developing and use an air reserve in the exploitation phase to support any advances. Remember, artillery in reaction and exploitation have to be in reserve. Air units don't. So just don't use everything all at once because this will make your allied air force so much more reactive into supporting your front line. So that's how I would think about supporting the Allies. For the Axis, air defense of Tunis and Berserta is your absolute number one priority. That is your home. You have nothing else. Your air bases, your supply network, all of that kind of stuff will be severely degraded if you don't protect it uh, with overlapping patrol zones. This is where, for example, some of those less good fighters become super useful in propping up the air defenses of this zone. Number two, use those hit, shoot capable aircraft to support your local attacks, avoiding flak and avoiding interception where you can. Do train busting to hinder reinforcements and the movement of supplies at key junctions. I've, I've named a few here. Some of these might become headquarters, but not all of them. If they have uh, headquarters, they get flak. Um, this is a, a good way to slow down the allies as they continue to build up. And a handy use for some of those fighters that aren't really strong enough to be put onto patrol zone duty in your air defenses. Number five, your surge capacity up in Sicily is a huge asset, but it only builds up gradually. So there's a one in six chance that you'll get a special result in your replacement that will allow you to refit three planes. You start with six planes. So really it will take about a month and a third for you to get all six active altogether. And then you can use them all at once as part of a big attack. Now, yeah, you could decide um, to do the opposite and greedily blurt them out every time you are lucky enough to get one of these special results. But um, I would try and save them up to really make a difference. And that's it. Next up, actually, I'm not going to talk about uh, uncertainty, fog of war, all of that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk about supply because um, my mate Steve asked me to. So, yeah, I hope that's been useful. Thanks for watching and look after yourself.